Nye. Bl. Gh. Believe it or not, I'm still alive. That's right, I am back from my seemingly indefinite hiatus to tell you that that hiatus was not indefinite. Anyways, Kikarodontosaurus. The large theropod lived 90 million years ago in the Chemchem Formation, said formation being found in North Africa. Similar to where we find any fossils, the Chemchem Formation was most likely a wetland at the time, as that's where fossilization is most likely to take place. Living in the Chemchem Formation were various animals, as it's a decently well-documented area as far as fossil sites are concerned. It was by all means a dinosaur-dominated landscape, as was most of the world at the time. Teeming with ankylosaurus, Crocodilomorphs, Ornithopods, Sauropods, and our favorites, Cacarodontosaurus Saharicus and Spinosaurus Aegypticus. So, where did it all go wrong? What happened? Some of you may be thinking that they got wiped out by the asteroid, but you would be very incorrect. In fact, the Chemchem Paleofauna left this world a whole 28 million years prior to the asteroid. What really happened is something that I'm sure that all of us are familiar at this point. Climate change. Our lovely, good old, rapidly accelerating friend, climate change. Now, this climate change was naturally occurring, unlike what we are experiencing modern day, but it was still very devastating. It isn't exactly known what happened specifically, but what it was most likely was flooding destroying the environment of the Chemchem Formation, thus leading to the downfall of its fauna. And unfortunately, we don't know what became of any of the species there. But generally, animals are very resilient, and while they wouldn't just shrug off something like that, odds are some animals had descendants that evolved and survived. We simply do not have the fossil evidence to know what they could have been. But it really makes you think, or at least it makes me think, which is why I'm making a video on it. You saw the title, you clicked the thumbnail, you know what this is about. Similar to my video on Spinosaurus over half a year ago, where I made these lovely lads. God, those drawings are old. I should probably redraw those, but I'm not going to. This video will be covering its main rival, Cacarodontosaurus. Cacarodontosaurus, or the shark-toothed lizard, was the apex predator of its environment, measuring around 40 feet and potentially averaging up to 8 tons. It wasn't quite the largest carnivore of its environment, that title of course going to Spinosaurus aegypticus, but it didn't need to be since they both served completely different roles in the ecosystem. Spinosaurus filmed the role of a semi-aquatic fish eater, having large claws and an elongated snout to catch fish out of the water by the riverside like a heron, or using its paddle tail to dive after larger fish in rivers. Either way, it was a fish eater. Cacarodontosaurus, on the other hand, certainly wasn't. Our current understanding of Cacarodontosaurus leads us to believe that it hunted large herbivores, specifically the Chemchem Formation sauropods, such as Rebeccasaurus. Cacarodontosaurus was also the fourth largest carnivorous dinosaur ever discovered, being fairly comparable in Spinosaurus, at least in terms of weight. Despite being potentially the toughest animal in the Chemchem Formation, Cacarodontosaurus would certainly not do great surviving its environmental change, and in all likelihood had no living descendants. But where's the fun in that? We're here to think of what they could potentially look like if they did survive. If we accept the fact that they all died, this video would be a very short one, and I don't get any new subscribers, so I do need to make this video anyways. Let's start with a basic biology lesson. Smaller animals tend to do better in dangerous circumstances than larger animals. The main reason for this is due to the fact that small animals need drastically less food than larger animals. Larger animals have pretty vast quantities of bodily processes to sustain due to their higher mass. Because of this, they need more food to allow them to keep going. Naturally, smaller animals will do better when there's less food available than larger individuals. Natural selection would choose these individuals to survive while large members of the species would go and die off. As you could probably guess, this would affect Cacarodontosaurus, resulting in smaller and smaller Cacarodontosaurus as the generations pass. This is similar to what happened with my evolution of Spinosaurus, where selective pressures resulted in smaller and more aquatic Spinosaurus. Now, we also need to look at the diet of Cacarodontosaurus to figure out how its anatomy would be affected. Cacarodontosaurus was a carnivore. Go figure, the shark-toothed lizard is a carnivore. Who could have guessed? But I'm looking for what prey it hunted specifically. 
Now, Pygardontosaurids are pretty well known for their teeth. Long, sharp, serrated teeth. Perfectly designed to cause as much blood loss as possible. Having to have your prey bleed to death is only useful when your prey is much larger than you are, and there are only two groups of dinosaurs that manage to grow larger than megatheropods, hadrosaurs and sauropods, and out of those two, only one lived in the Kenkin formation, sauropods. It's pretty obvious that there is no terrestrial animal, alive or dead, that can actually take on a large sauropod in an actual fight. So any predator that wanted to take them on had to be pretty creative on how they were going to prey on them. And there are two main methods that we believe that theropods would have used when hunting large sauropods. Either A, taking chunks off of them and eating those, leaving the sauropod alive, or B, causing massive blood loss, causing the sauropod to bleed to death, allowing for long consumption of a valuable food source. Cacarodontosaurus taking the latter method. Now, there is a problem with having sauropods as your main food source. Well, there are a lot of problems with it, as there are with any prey, but there is one problem with sauropods specifically. They were really big. As I previously stated, larger animals do worse in extinction circumstances, and it doesn't get bigger than sauropods, minus whales, and they likely wouldn't do too well in an event similar to what happened in the Chemchem formation, and while I will probably end up adding mega sauropods later on in the series, since sauropods are dope, for now, we're gonna go under the assumption that our sauropod friends didn't make it. This means Cacarodontosaurus is gonna have to find another food source than what it previously ate. Luckily, the Chemchem does have other, albeit smaller, herbivores for Cacarodontosaurus to prey on, though it will need some serious changes to its anatomy if it is to hunt effectively. With this, I believe we have enough information to finally get into the animals that I have designed for this video. Sociculturonychus laticanthus, name meaning social knife claw, colorful spot. This is a much, much smaller descendant of Cacarodontosaurus, only measuring in at 19 feet in length and weighing less than a ton. Female individuals are a very simple mottled brown, while males have longer neck spines and a colorful crest. The neck spines are present on females, but they serve no purpose, having only evolved as a display feature. As their name suggests, these are very social animals, being strategic pack hunters, very different from how we believe most theropods would have been. The foundations of a pack system was already likely present in Cacarodontosaurus. Since they were taking on sauropods, it is believed that Cacarodontosaurids would have occasionally banded together to take down megasauropods. These groups, however, were not coordinated and didn't last long after the kill was made, and would have likely resulted in the animals fighting over the carcass. Regardless, this frankly brutal system is the baseline for a social structure found in Sociculturonychus. Over time, selective pressures caused by their smaller forms resulted in them depending on each other more and more as time went by. They follow a loose social structure, with one to four older individuals commanding a group of assorted younger, less experienced individuals. Whether that be the offspring of the older individuals, or some random sociculturonychus that just sort of joined the group, they all follow the orders of the select older sociculturonychus. When those younger ones grow older, they may eventually leave to start their own groups or take over when one of the elders die. They actually hunt rather quite similarly to their ancestors, causing larger prey to bleed to death. It's just with Sociculturonychus, they're doing it with coordination. Truxosaurus neocarodon, nay meaning Grim Lizard, New Shark Tooth. Cacarodontosaurus was already the apex predator of the Chemchem formation, and that likely wouldn't change. However, the prey that it hunts likely would. Cacarodontosaurus, as previously mentioned, likely hunted sauropods. And as I stated previously, we are going under the assumption that there are no longer any sauropods in this area. This is a fairly reasonable assumption, sauropods were huge and required a lot of food to remain functional. With less food available, the sauropod species in the Chemchem formation would likely go extinct, and thus Cacarodontosaurus descendants would need to find another prey item and adjust their anatomy accordingly. Trexosaurus is smaller than Cacarodontosaurus, only measuring about 35 feet and 4 to 5 tons. Now, that is quite the large animal, larger than I realistically should have made it, but it's my video and I can do what I want, and this is still possible. Now, you may have noticed its relatively short snout. This is because this carnivore hunts very differently from its ancestor. 
instead of biting its prey and causing massive blood loss, it instead full-on brawls with whatever prey it may be hunting. Its skull is shortened to better grab and lock onto similarly sized prey, whilst helping to deal with the stresses on the skull caused by thrashing prey. Grabbing onto and holding any unfortunate animal, while its long arms and claws deal most of the damage. These interactions leave pretty distinctive scars on both the Truxosaurus from the prey fighting back and the survivors of such attacks, leaving very distinctive streaks of scar tissue caused by numerous slashes from Truxosaurus claws. These are much less social animals than Sociculturnitus, living a solitary lifestyle. Sometimes they will group up to take on herd animals, but mainly they live completely alone. Only during the mating season will they meet up with other Truxosaurus, both to mate and to fight for the right to mate. Most Truxosaurus males bear deep scars from fighting over females along with scars from territorial dispute. Males do not tolerate other males inside of their territory and will scare off any smaller males and attempt to fight off similarly sized males. They may tolerate one or two females staying in sections of their territory, but even then that never lasts long. They are not too keen on having neighbors. After mating, it will actually be the males that look after the eggs, since the males live in a defined territory, while the females tend to live more nomadically, and thus wouldn't stay to look after a nest. The male will check in on the nest multiple times per day between patrols of territory, and will sleep in the same area as the nest is located. Upon hatching, the chicks will stay with their father for about six weeks before they leave to live on their own, setting up their own niches taking on smaller animals. They'll continue to grow throughout their lives until eventually the surviving offspring will continue on the cycle. Unfortunately for both of these evolutions, if they or something similar ever existed, their bloodlines came to a halt when a rock the size of a mountain breached through Earth's atmosphere and slammed into the waters near the Yucatan Peninsula, starting off the KT mass extinction event and ending the age of Arctosauria. While it's very unlikely that either of these animals would have existed, nor would we likely ever be able to know, since the environment that came after the Chemchem Formation was likely not an area that would preserve fossils, it will always be fun to consider what possibly could have been, regardless of how likely. That's what these videos are about after all, fun first and foremost. So if you had fun watching this video, that's what I try to do on this channel, so you might consider subscribing to support me and my development and content in the future. I have a decent chunk of videos planned for the near-ish future, so stay tuned for that. If you're still here and haven't left already, toss this video a like. Remember to stay inquisitive and know that Clippy stands against AI age verification. That'll do it for this one, and I will now be taking my leave. Bye!